Islam and, and is the sin that Allah will not forgive. Okay. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala ma ba'i Shaykh Hussain wa Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala Here he's talking about uh, the relationship between shirk and arrogance And the reason why he's talking about that is because he said that there are two things that are uh, polar opposites to Islam Right? The one is shirk because shirk is submitting to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala along with Allah and the other opposite, if you will, is arrogance. Because arrogance is what? Arrogance is somebody who refuses to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is, that they refuse to openly submit, though there is going to be some form of submission as, we cover, as we've covered previously. So he goes on to say, uh, in the last ayah that we covered, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, To the end of the ayah, he said that we will turn away uh, those who behave arrogantly, uh, we're going to turn them away from our signs to the point that if they saw every single sign, they, they still wouldn't believe, even though it's right there in front of their face, faces, right? And, and, and we said that the result of arrogance is what? Is ama, honey. That is that they won't be able to see, uh, they, they won't have any insight that even though all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's signs are very clear. They won't be able to see any of them, right? So the, the, that is the result of those who behave arrogantly when it comes to their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now here the translation says, because arrogant pride is the same as shirk, and shirk is opposed to Islam and is the sin that Allah will not forgive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Now, uh, this uh, is a bit disjointed because of the way uh, of the Arabic style. So Shaykh al-Islam is starting a sentence and then he has this long, um, uh, I don't know exactly, I forget the English term for it, but he has this long digression in the, in the sentence itself before he comes back to, his, to, to the point that he's trying to make. So what I want you to do, just follow very quickly and then we'll go back and we'll cover it. What he's saying here, he says, now, he actually does not say that arrogant pride is the same as shirk. He says that, uh, he says, al-kibru mustalziman li shirk. Which means that, that arrogance uh, that necessarily brings about, and he leads to, leads to a shirk. Yani, so a person who ha has drowned in pride and, and, and arrogance, will necessarily become, yani will have some element of, of shirk, right? So he says, because of that, now skip the ayat, he says, because of that, all of the prophets were sent with the religion of Islam. That, that's actually the end of the sentence. But he's going off to say, once, once he mentions shirk, he comes in to say, and shirk is what? Is, is the sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will not forgive and this is the evidence for that and then he comes back to, to the point to say that, that because of this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the prophets with the religion of Islam which is the only religion that Allah will accept so read it and then we'll explain inshallah because of this all the prophets who sent la, la, la. start from the top because of arrogant pride uh, oh, no, this is the, uh, because arrogant pride is the same as shirk, and shirk is opposed to Islam. Okay, read that again. Okay. Yeah. Because arrogant pride is the same as shirk, and shirk is opposed to Islam, and is the sin that Allah will not forgive. Allah says in Surah Nisa, Allah forgives not that partner should be set up with him, but he forgives anything else to whom he pleases. To set up partners with Allah is to devise a sin most heinous indeed. Allah forgives not the sin of joining other gods with him, but he forgives whom he pleases other sins than this. One who joins other gods with Allah has strayed far, far away from the right. Right, so uh, these two ayahs, both, both of which are in Surah Al-Nisa, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bih. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive that should be committed with him that anybody sets up a partner with him that is not forgiven and anything less than that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will 
uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may or may not forgive. And that is what is known as that a, a, a person is taht al meaning that they are under Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. If Allah Azza wa Jal wills, He forgives them, and if He does not will, then He does not forgive them. And it is not from the aqeed of Ahl Sunnah that a person who dies on sin, that they are necessarily going to the hellfire. We don't know. Allah may forgive them without them having repented. And for those who have repented, this ayah is not talking about them. This ayah is talking about the people who do not repent. In Allah la yaghfiru and yushraka bi. Allah doesn't forgive that. What? That shirk be committed. That there be partners associated with him. Tayyip. Uh, the, the, reason, the way we know that this I is not talking about for those who have repented is because all of the campaigns before the Prophet والسلام, or almost all of them did what? Shirk. Committed shirk. Almost all of them across the board. And then they did what? They repented. And their repentance was Islam. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them for all of the things that came before that. Including the shirk. Right? And the same thing happens today. There are many Muslims around the globe, many Muslims around the globe, who were brought up in an environment where shirk is promoted. And so they commit shirk. Some of them unknowingly. They don't realize that this is shirk. And then they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they repent. And Allah accepts the repentance of those who sincerely repent to him. So this ayah is not talking about those who, those who do what? Those who repent. This ayah is dealing specifically with those who do not repent. As for those who repent, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yaghfiru dhunuba jami'an. He forgives all sins, no matter how grave they, they may be. For those who do not repent, then they are under Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. He may punish them for their sins, or he may forgive them, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does that go back into arrogance because they choose... Uh, because of the shirk and have not repented, that goes that attributes to the arrogance. Look, some some people. Not everybody does not repent because of arrogance. So some people don't repent because they don't know they can. The man who killed ninety nine people, he went and he asked, as the Prophet Isaiah was saying, informed us. He went. He was looking for a way to repent, and when he went to uh, the that worshiper. Right, and he asked him. I need mean, the people say, "Look, you know, he's a worshiper. He's somebody I mean, who's close to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala." They went and asked him, and he said, "Look, I killed ninety nine people. Is there any way I can make toba?" Man said, "No, there's no way you can make toba." So he became number one hundred because if was, if there's no avenue for repentance, what's stopping him from? from just continuing in his way. But then he was informed about a real scholar. And he went to him, he said, is there a way for me to repent? So his, his not repenting up until that point was not because of arrogance, right? <coughs> By the time he got to the scholar and he said, look, I've killed 100 people, is there a way for me to repent? And he said, yes, but you have to go to such and such a land. In other words, you have to get out of the environment that is causing, that has led to you being the way that you are right now. And this is one of the you know, indications that, it, that if a person is committing sins over and over and over again, even though they have the desire not to commit that sin, they want to make Tawbah. And one of the things that's very important is for them to get out of the environment that is facilitating for them the ease of that sin that they are, that they are committing. But the, the point is that not everybody who doesn't repent, uh, they, they're failing to repent is not necessarily because of, because of arrogance. Now. Because of this, all the prophets were sent with the religion of Islam, which is the only religion that Allah will accept. He will not accept any other religion, not from the earlier generations, nor the later generations. Okay, nor the latter generations. Nor the latter generations. Tell you. Okay, let's stop right there. Bismillah. Here says that all of the prophets were sent with the religion of Islam, which is the only religion that Allah will accept. He will not accept any other religion. 
Hamid, I don't want you to answer this question, but anybody else can answer. What does that mean that all of the prophets were, were sent with the religion of Islam? Musa, alayhi salam. Musa was sent with Islam. Pays a cat 2.5%. Ibrahim alayhi salam fasted the month of Ramadan? No. Hold on, Tay. <laughs> Hold on. A Muslim, a Muslim, if you said, is it from Islam to pay zakat? They tell you what? Okay. Yes, okay. Fast the month of Ramadan? Yeah. Yes, okay. You just said that the previous prophets, they didn't do that. They didn't do 2.5% for zakat, surplus wealth. They didn't fast the month of Ramadan. We don't know that they prayed five times a day. But you're still saying that they were Muslim? So somebody could just be Muslim today. They could just say, I'm Muslim, like Ibrahim was Muslim. No? All right, I got to explain that. Okay, submission. So Islam is, is submission, and they were all sent with submission. Okay. Keep it going. Yeah. Um, because each prophet was sent with different revelations, so certain things that are ordained now weren't ordained back then because it hadn't come to fruition yet. So, books, right? so how was it Islam? Because as it was revealed, they followed it as everything was revealed. So you're saying that Musa was not uh, Jewish? I'm saying that religion. Or he didn't Bible. follow the, he didn't follow Judaism. <laughs> I'm saying and Isa didn't completed. follow Christianity. I'm saying the religion was completed by Prophet Muhammad at the end of as a facility of the prophet. So right. he didn't have all the information. Alhamdulillah. All right, listen. The, the, what, what's, what's important to understand in any time you study anything is to know what you, is to understand that words may refer to different things in different contexts, right? So don't just take a word as it is, right? And not understand the context in which it's being used, all right? So Islam in, the, in, in our religion, in the revelation, is used for, with three different connotations, though they're all directly related. Three different connotations, right? So we have what is known as al Islam al Am, right? Which is the general term of Islam, which is to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with tawheed, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, and full submission to Him. Every messenger, and, that, and we're going to go over that, inshallah, in a minute, from Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam. Ibrahim, moving on down the line, and Musa, and Suleiman, and Isa, all of them came with the, what we would call Islam in general. And none of them came with a different religion. Right? None of them came with a different religion. There's no such... We, today, people like to use the term the Abrahamic faiths. Faiths. But Ibrahim didn't have faiths. With an S. Ibrahim came with one deen. And that was Millat Ibrahim Hanifan. He came with the religion of Tawheed. The worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. The faith was one. Now, we it's not totally wrong to say Abrahamic faiths in the sense that all of these faiths attribute themselves to, to Ibrahim. But all of them are not correct. All of them are not correctly attributed to Ibrahim, right? But in that sense, I mean, you know, when you're dealing with certain dialogue, if you understand that, then that's fine. But the, the point is that Ibrahim only had one faith and he only came with one deen. And all of the prophets only came with one deen, right? The Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, said, said, al-anbiya'u ikhwatun li'illat, that the Prophets are all maternal brothers. They're maternal brothers. Ikhwatun li illat, yani that, that is, uh, excuse me, they are paternal brothers. Uh, that is, that they are all, um, that they all have the same father, right? But their mothers are different. 
And so the Prophet some actually went on to say, he said, Deenuhum wahid wa ummahatuhum shatta. That is that their, that their religion is one religion, but their legislations are, are different. Right? So these ones may pray three times a day. That Prophet might have prayed six times a day. We don't know. Exactly. We do know that they prayed, all of them. They all gave zakat. They all fasted. And Ibrahim was the one that did what? That actually was the first one to make the sunnah of hajj to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the point is that Islam is used in that way to mean what? The general religion that all of the prophets came, which was submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the form of tawheed and the worship of him alone. Then there is what is known as al-Islam al-Khas, yani specific Islam. And that is the legislation that our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with. So normally today, when we use the term Islam just like that, then we are referring to what? To the exact legislation that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with. Tight. That's number one and number two. There's a third way that Islam is used in the text. Who's gonna tell me? And all of you know, because as soon as I say it, you're gonna be like, oh yeah, I knew that. <laughs> I'll, give you a, I'll give you a hint, Hadith Jibreel. The Hadith of Jibreel, he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked him three questions, what did he ask him? What is Islam and what is Iman and what is Ihsan? When he asked the Prophet what is Islam, what did the Prophet talk about? He talked about what? The external rituals of Islam. And when he asked him about Iman, what did the Prophet talk about? The beliefs, right? The creed that, that a person has, right? So here, Islam. And Iman, when mentioned in the same, when they're mentioned in the same text, in the same context, then Islam is going to refer to one's external practice, whereas Iman refers to the internal beliefs that are held, right? But if Islam is mentioned by itself, right, then it includes the internal beliefs. And when Iman is mentioned by itself, yani in lieu of Islam, then it also refers to external actions, right? Like, so here he says, because all of this, the, the, the prophets were sent with the religion of Islam, which is the only religion that Allah will accept. He will not accept any other religion, not from the earlier generations. So from the earlier generations here, he's talking about from the time, he's not talking about earlier generations of the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's talking about from the early, earliest of mankind, okay? Nor from the latter generations, yani up until now. No. La qala Nuh. Nuh alayhi wa sallam said, but if you turn back, no reward have I asked of you. My reward is only due from Allah. And I have been commanded to be of those who submit to Allah's will. So, so literally in the Quran, wa umibtu an akuna min al muslimin. Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam said, I have been commanded to be from amongst the Muslims. Right? So Nuh called himself a what? A Muslim. Right. So the, the, the author right now is going to bring us several ayat from the because he because his point here is that all of the messengers were sent with, with what? With Islam. And Islam is the what? Opposite of shirk and the opposite of arrogance. So all of, the, all of the prophets were sent with this. Okay? None of them were allowed to be arrogant. None of them were allowed to associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Allah said in Surah Al-Baqarah, and, and who turns away from the religion of Ibrahim, but such as debase their souls with holy him we choose and render pure in this world, and he will be in the hereafter in the ranks of the righteous. Behold, his Lord said to him, Bow. He said, I will. So, I so again, uh, uh, bow your will to me. Hmm. 
قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلَمْ And the point, again, the point here, and just, just a note for, you know, for those of you who translate or have aspirations to translate, right? That if you're, if you're bringing home the point of an author, the point of the author here is to do what? To show that all of the prophets came with Islam. That all of them were commanded by law, in fact, to be Muslim. So you have to use the terminology that's going to bring out, I mean, in the Arabic is very clear, right? But in the English, you have to bring out the terminology that's going to clarify the objective of the author. If you're not clarifying the author's objective, then you're not really staying true to, to the text, right? So here, uh, what I believe is that um, because this is, a quite, this is an old translation um, from the 90s, uh, so, I don't think that there were many translations available of the, the Quran at that time. And they probably used the uh, Yusuf Ali uh, translation. And without realizing that as a translator, sometimes you have to go in and you can't just rely on someone else's translation. That, that you actually have to go in and make it make sense in the, in the context that it's being. Anyway. So he says, it's called Allahu Rabbu Aslam. Behold, his Lord said to him, Aslam. Aslam means what? Be a Muslim. <laughs> right. He said, be a Muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu when he would write his letters, he would say what? Aslam Taslam. He would send his letters to the, to the leaders of different you know, nations and tribes. Aslam, become Muslim, Taslam. You'll be safe. You'll, 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 you'll have peace. Right? So. His Lord said to him, Aslam, be a Muslim, right? Submit. And Ibrahim said, no. Nah. He said, uh, I Aslam to the Lord and cherish the universe. Now, call Aslam to the Rabbil Alameen. He said, I have what? Aslam. I have become Muslim. I have submitted to Rabbil Alameen. Nah. And this was the legacy that Ibrahim left to his sons. And so did Ya'qub. O oh my sons, Allah has chosen the faith for you. Allah then do not accept in the state of submission to Allah. Right. فَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ And this is what they said to, this is what Yaqub said to his, to his children. Don't die except as Muslims. Don't die except as Muslims. Right. So here we have what? Nuh saying that he was a Muslim. Ibrahim saying that he was a Muslim. Yaqub saying that he was a Muslim and telling his his children to be to, to die in the state of Islam and as the scholars was, as the scholars of Tafsir mentioned any command to die a certain way is actually a command to what to live that way because you don't know when you're going to die and so that is almost like uh, it's actually أبلغ, يعني it's it's stronger rhetorically than saying live this way when I'm telling you to die a certain way because basically it's like, live this way until you take your last breath, right? Which is a little different than, hey, live this way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us, because they're obviously in, in Ali Amman, I, I add that you probably hear every Jummah, right? But this is also the statement that Yaqub said to his, to his children, don't die except as, as Muslims. I mean, that's a deep, you know, uh, statement. And a lot of times, you know, a person may fail to realize that what's actually being said here is to live Islam. To live it until your last breath. No. Yusuf alayhi salam said, Take my soul at death as one submitting to your will as a Muslim and unite me with the righteous. Right. This dua is a, is a dua alim jiddan. Right? It's a, it's a very, you know, tremendous dua. Where Yusuf alayhi salam says, Tawaffani musliman. Right, take my soul, tawaffani, uh, cause me to die as a Muslim. Subhanallah. I mean, don't don't take that lightly. The fact that this is a prophet of Allah, a prophet of Allah who's been through many trials at the time when he's making this statement. He's been through many trials already, right? Uh, and he says, tawaffani Muslima. Cause me to die as a Muslim. And put me in the... Tulhiq uh, means to put something with something else. Make, allow me to catch up to 
and be in the company of and be with the righteous as uh, now look at look at that and look at the the ayat that just came before or those ayat what did Allah say about Ibrahim in the hereafter says وَمَنْ يَرْغَبُ عَمْ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ إِلَّا مَنْ سَفِيهَا نَفْسَهُ وَلَقَدْ اصْطَفَيْنَاهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَإِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ يعني الله عالم يعني but Yusuf عليه السلام may have been saying وَأَلْحِقَنِي بِالصَّالِحِينَ يعني and put me in the company of Ibrahim in, in, in the hereafter يعني the same way that we make dua for what? to be in the company of the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم in in, in, in the hereafter, right? Well, the best of mankind, the best of mankind, after the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ had not been, was not born yet, right? During the time of Yusuf, the best of mankind after the Prophet ﷺ is who? Ibrahim, Ibrahim right? So, uh, Allahu Alam, I haven't uh, done enough uh, searching in the tafsir to see if any of the scholars have, have mentioned that, and I'm not going to make up my own statements. But what al hiqani bi salihin and it's the first time I ever realized it though. See, seeing it back to back, right? Because Shaykh al-Islam is talking about here, wa innahu fil akhirati la min al-salihin. And then he says, wa qala Yusuf, tawaffani musliman wa al hiqani bi salihin. Cause me to die as a Muslim and put me in the company, and in the hereafter, amongst the, amongst the righteous. Obviously, the righteous is a broad category, right? It's not just Ibrahim, alayhi salam, but he would have been the best of the righteous. And at that particular, at that particular time, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows best. Mm. Nah. But du'a is a du'a that we should memorize. We should say it frequently too. And I ask Allah to cause you to die as a Muslim and to put you with the righteous in the hereafter. And what else could a person want? Mm. Nah. said, "Oh my people, if you do really believe in me, then in Him put your trust." Wow, 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 not much in me. If, if, you do, if you do really believe in Allah, then in Him put your trust. And if you submit your will to His, they said, in Allah we put our trust. Okay. So Musa alayhi salam, he says, Ya qawmi in kuntum amantum billah. If you truly believe in Allah, then what? Fa'alayhi tawakkalu. Then in Him, put your tawakkul, your reliance, and your trust. He says, in kuntum muslimin. If you are, in fact, Muslims. If you are, in fact, Muslims. And he, all of them are saying the same thing. And again, if, if somebody was to just sit back and say, uh, this book was authored by Muhammad. Right? I need to say that. It's just a claim that this is from Allah. You... you you would have found a lot of discrepancy in the book, a lot of differences here and there, right? But look at this. Look at the consistency of what the prophets are saying to their people. I mean, this is just one example. I mean, not to mention that modern-day linguists, interestingly enough, I mean, they've, they've studied the, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, and they've studied, they've, they've made comparisons with, uh, for example, Sahih al-Bukhari, right? And found that over 80% of the, the speech is different. Even the words, right? In other words, the Quran has its own style. The Quran has its own style. Very different from the speech of the Prophet Wasallam himself as recorded in Sahih al-Bukhari, which is the most authentic book. If, if the two books were the same, You'd be able to pick that up. I mean, if the if the author was the same, you'd be able to pick that up. But this is th these are some of those modern you know studies within the last fifteen to twenty years that linguists have done because they're able to I and mean, because everything is computerized now they're able to do those type of comparisons to just show you that this is not a book that was written by Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that this book is truly from Allah subhanahu wa taala. You know what else I find interesting? You know we're going through this book which is only not even a hundred pages, right, or something like that. And 
how many mistakes have we come across, Several. right? And then if they do another edition, you know what's gonna happen? Still gonna be mistakes, and you're still gonna correct, and you got, you got all this time to do what? Even though you may even put a whole bunch of people all working on the same project, and they try to fix it and copy edit and everything else, guess what's gonna happen? It's going to be mistakes. Yeah, I mean, I'm saying even with next editions, the Quran didn't have any next editions. It only had one edition. And it came out the way it is, Allahu Akbar. And with one edition. And on top of that, it was revealed to the Prophet over a period of time where he was going through some very difficult struggles and still the message remained consistent. And that's not the way the human mind works. It doesn't work like that. When you're going through something, it comes out different. It comes out different on paper. You, you, you have a, you, you know, it's good. Your writing is going to be affected by what you're going through at the time. Somebody's going through death in a the family. They're going to, when they write, it's, it, there's going to be a type of sorrow that, that, that you can pick up in there. If, if you're going through a, a happy time and what, that's going to come out. All of that comes, the Quran is, subhanAllah, a real stable tone. Even when the Prophet ﷺ was going through some of the most difficult times, Allah's revelation came to him and reassured him and was, was a guidance for the believers. I mean, just, it's amazing. I mean, I'm just, I, I don't know what triggered it just now, but I was thinking about, subhanAllah, the consistency. That all of these messengers were coming, saying, be Muslim, I am Muslim, I, right? That's limit. And that, and that was their call. And the religion that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the, uh, according to him subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the only religion that he will accept is Islam. No. Allah said, it was we who revealed the law to Musa, therein was guidance and light. By its standards have been judged the Jews, by the prophets who bowed as in Islam to Allah's will. No. Qala yahkumu biha nabiyyun so he's talked about all of the uh, they usually call them the rabbinical prophets right all of them who who eslamu all of them who accepted Islam all of them who were Muslims so all of those prophets from Bani Israel were considered to be Muslims no that's uh, Bil Qais yeah said oh my lord I have indeed wronged my soul I do submit with Solomon to the Lord of the world. Uh, call it Aslam to Aslam to. That's what she said. I have become Muslim with Sulaiman and I have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Lord of the worlds. Uh, uh, Shaykh Islam said the, the prophets, but here he's talking about Bilqis. Was Bilqis a prophet? No. No? You sure? How do you know Bilqis wasn't a prophet? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ibn Hazm, you <laughs> Yeah, uh, the majority of scholars of Islam say that there were, there were no female prophets. There were no female prophets, right? So why did Sheikh Islam bring this eye? Does he believe that Bill Qis is a prophet? Ah, Islam to my Sulaiman, right. She said, I become Muslim with Sulaiman. In other words, Sulaiman is a what? Is a Muslim, and he's a prophet. <coughs> and so that's why Sheikh Islam is an eye, an eye. Allah said, and behold, I inspired for the, the disciples to have faith in me and my messenger. They said, we have faith and bear witness that we bow to Allah as Muslims. Yeah, see, see how they translated it there. That was, uh, that was how you would have wanted the, the rest of the translations to have, have been to kind of highlight the fact that they are saying that they are Muslims, right? So these are the Hawariyin, uh, those who were with Isa alayhi salam. And they said, Amanna, washhada bi annana muslimun. The religion before Allah. So, so this here, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the prophets. Uh, and now, now, uh, Shaykh al-Islam is going to mention some ayat that just talk in general that go back to his other point, which is what? So he said two things before. If you go back to page 81, he said, All of the prophets were sent with the religion of Islam. That's his first claim. Right? And then he mentions ayat to support that claim. Then he also says, which is the only religion that Allah will accept. That's a separate claim. And so now he's also going to bring evidence 
for that claim, which is that it is the only religion that Allah will accept. No. The, the religion before me, uh, sorry, the religion before Allah is Islam, submission to His will. And also in Surah Al Imran, if anyone desires a religion other than Islam, never will it be accepted of Him. No. And, and this here, as the scholars of Tafsir have mentioned, if what is refer, being referred to in the deen in the law, al-Islam, uh, or, or in the second ayah, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَيْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ Right? If anyone desires a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted of him. This Islam here, if it's talking about the Islam al-Aam, yani the general Islam of submission, then that would refer to each and every prophet and their particular legislation. And if it's referring to the specific uh, Islam, then that is the legislation that was given to Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and anybody after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nothing will be accepted of him, N nothing will be accepted of them other than the deen of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yani his, his legislation. Now. Do they seek for other than the religion of Allah while all creatures of the heavens and the Okay, this is actually a different topic here, um, but the, it, we'll, we'll get into it inshallah. Uh, give me a second. Yeah. Yeah, so those two ayahs, those two ayahs are supporting the claim that what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that there's no other deen that will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let me just say that ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you to uh, be firm in your study of his deen, right? Because this systematic study to kind of go through things and just take your time learning your religion, it's, it's not the trend right now, right? It, it used to be, it used to be that it was very common, let's just say, to find in the masajid that you would have a sheikh or somebody who had learned the deen and the way that they learned the deen, they would pass it on to others and they would, you know, open up a book or they would teach people tafsir and fiqh and aqidah and so forth. But now, uh, you know, because the, uh, I, I don't just want to blame it on attention spans, right? Because I, we're still the same human beings that we were. I mean, I don't know, maybe microwave change thing, I don't know, McDonald's food. But the, the point is that now people want to be entertained. And, and this was actually brought into Islam, like as in education for fad, like a f edutainment type purposes, right? And, and what happens is, and there was, a, there was a reason why the people who initially started that started it, and they felt like they were connecting to a, a group of people who otherwise would not sit in the masjid, they wouldn't learn Islam. So we can give them at least something so they can learn some parts of their religion even though, but, but, but a lot of mafasid also came with that or a lot of, there's a lot of drawbacks to that, right? So, I mean, you think about uh, a person in any field, subhanAllah, if, if you teach them all the shortcuts, right? You teach them the shortcut. You teach them all the little tricks of the trade and they can do something really well. But the minute that something doesn't go exactly as you taught them, they don't know what to do. Why? Because they skip so many steps, right? And the other problem is that they think they know, even though they've skipped the steps. And that's in any field, whether it's plumbing, electricity, medicine, engineering, or anything, anything across the board. They skip steps, they may be able to do that one thing, and then the problem is they really think they know now. They'll even talk back to you, you know, because they know and you don't know, right? Even though you taught them, right? So the same thing happens. When you skip all these steps and you think, yeah, I'm learning now, and, I, and you know, I do a, a weekend course, and now I know something about Aqidah, and I know Sul Fiqh, and I know Fiqh, and all this other stuff. And it's just like, that's not how the deen works. It's not how it works. There's, there's some struggle that has to go into this. And I'm, I'm saying this because you, just be patient with it. Be in the line, and you will see the fruit. You'll see the fruit later on down the line. Because the, the fads will go away. 
they, they, they can't really stick around. Right now, everything is podcast, right? And th these interviews, like people are learning their dean through interviews, right? I mean, it's, and it's, it's really weird, right? But it's a thing right now, and I mean, I guess COVID kind of like pushed that to a, to a next level. But the idea of how do you really learn your religion, sitting down for hours at a time and learning fiqh, learning tafsir, learning aqidah, and going through books, right? Going through, and uh, not always going through books. Sometimes you may sit with, with some of the scholars, and this was also common, where they were learning, and they would take you through a certain subject based off of what they had learned. And that's fine too, as long as you're taken from somebody who learned from somebody, right? You're, you, there's a chain, right, that goes. But, but, but the, the quick style is, is not gonna cut it. And it is, all it does is give you a boost. And a boost is only as, as good as you can keep it, as long as you can keep it. Because otherwise, what happens after a boost? A crash. And usually you go lower than you were before you started, right? So a boost is good. The Moa'i was, was, has been in Islam from early, from early on. But that was never seen as the be all end all. The good talk, right? The good talk is to get you on, oh man, I'm back on track now, right? And then you start actually putting the work in. The good talk now has become not the means to an end, but it's become the objective in and of itself. So go hear a good talk. It's like, now that good talk's supposed to propel you to some type of stable, you know, and consistent action. I'm not going to go there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you go to the third eye. Yeah, go to the third eye. Mm -hmm. so. do, do they seek for other than the religion of Allah, where all creatures of the heavens and on earth have willing or unwilling bowed to his will? Yeah, keep going. Uh, the submission of, of all living things, willing or otherwise, is mentioned because all created things are enslaved to Allah in general, in general terms, whether they acknowledge it or not. Right. This is actually a, uh, the author is repeating something that he mentioned earlier, but he's repeating it for a particular reason here. But it is uh, Maghrib time. So I'm going to have to uh, push that off until next week, inshallah ta'ala, which will be our uh, last class before the Eid. And then, uh, inshallah, we'll take off uh, a week or two. And then, I'm, inshallah, I'm going to finish this book before we start back in September, our next 10-week session. I'm going to just try to finish off this book, uh, and then uh, I'm going to start a book by Ibn Qayyim, inshallah ta'ala, in September. And most likely is going to be a risala at tabukiyya uh, which is translated um, because there are some important lessons uh, in that book that need to be covered. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, one of the reasons why I'm considering that book is because it is translated and the translation is actually a decent, accurate translation. Um, uh, there's another book by Ibn Qayyim I'm considering that's also translated. And then there's a third one that, uh, that I'd like to work on perhaps uh, for January. Um, to, to kind of let's get into the, the works of Ibn al-Qayyim so that uh, you, know, you can compare and contrast. Ibn al-Qayyim was like, uh, he was the sharih. He was the, the one who explained the books of, uh, of Shaykh al-Islam and Taymiyyah. Because Shaykh al-Islam was his sheikh, right? Uh, and Ibn al-Qayyim also you know, benefited from other scholars, but he was the one that kind of took the, the works of, Ibn uh, of Shaykh al-Islam and Taymiyyah, or some of his works. And, um, and kind of massage them out so that you can see them in a, in a different light. Um, and uh, he brings some very important points in uh, Risala Tabukiya, so I'm considering that. This here, Shaykh al-Islam is basically uh, bringing back the point, which is that everybody, everybody submits some way, somehow. Willingly or un unwillingly, everybody has some level of Islam in the sense that they do what? That they submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they can't get away from from his will they cannot get away from the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if, if a person um, you know decided that they that they're not going to eat 
and they're not going to use the bathroom and they're not going to breathe. What's going to happen to them, right? They can't. They can't get away from that. They're going to submit to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed uh, for, for the human being. But there's also a level of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's shara', his legislation. And that is something that we're going to talk about, bi ta'ala, next week. Wallahu alam, subhanakallahu wa bihamdika, shara'u la ilaha ant, astaghfiruka wa tawbeelaik.